And here is a young man who comes from a house in an underprivileged section of the city. His father and mother are economically at a loss in that they must both work in order to get sufficient funds to get a roof over his head and to provide him with the clothing and the food he requires. And so his home is again no more than a room without people, without mother, without father. He is alone. And in this empty room, there is nothing which he requires or needs. And he must seek it and find it in the streets. What is his home? His home is where he will find affection, where people will recognize him and respond to him. It is in the street corner gang, where he suddenly emerges not as a lonely person without friend, but as one who is a leader whom others respect, others follow. Where there is affection, where there is response, where there is recognition, here is the substitute for his family. But he, immature, is the leader. He sees younger boys looking in the window and tells them, go in and get some cigarettes. Get them however you can and bring them back. And they, admiring him, go in. They rendezvous again on the lots, awaiting the return of those who've gone on this evil excursion. And they bring back their ill-begotten finding. And he divides up the loot, some for this and some for that. Here is a man of a boy. He here is the father for lack of a father. Here is he getting out of the street corner gang that which is denied him and which is not available in his family. Broken home, father, mother, yes, they are there, but they are there only in name, not in influence, not in function. So the absence or the presence of the father or the mother is not the determining factor. A knife can be a plaything in the hands of one boy. Or a knife can be a convincer in the hands of another. It depends on the world about you. We'll examine this world of the delinquents, their way of life, now, as we put the searchlights on juvenile delinquency. Uh, something of a natural history of a gang. Here we find the gang first starting to form. We'll see this in this environment in which they live. Here you find the kind of living conditions in which you find 25% of the boys of the country, and yet these 25% of the boys of the country are contributing to our court, 50% of the court cases. Here the boys are just getting together. It's casual, somewhat informal, yet it does have a structure. If you watch this small gang of boys carefully, you'll be able to tell pretty quickly who's the leader here. You see who makes the decisions about which way they ought to go, who they ought to call upon. They're going to meet with their friends here. They're just going to be horsing around a little bit. The normal youthful exuberance that you would find kids of this age. They're discussing here a problem which many youngsters find throughout the city. There's a new boy in the neighborhood. They're wondering about this boy, not in terms of shall they invite him or shall they not. They've got to control this new kid. They're wondering now how they ought to initiate him. There are various propositions being thrown out here. Uh, the leader is mulling these over. He'll pretty much decide which technique they're going to use for this initiation. 
Once they decide, they'll go out and look for the boy. They know where he's at. They'll know how to find him. There's a striking contrast, Dr. Brain, between the physical structures and the vacant spaces in which these kids have to have a social life together. They come out of those tenements, I take it, into these alleys and backwashes of the community, and here, without any direction or supervision by the adult community, they make their own world, do they not? Yes, they do. They make their own way. Uh, they decide what they're going to do because the parents in this area, the adults in this area, don't know what's going on with these kids. Here is the new boy. Now, he's peeling that orange with a straight-edge razor. You can tell that he's got experience at it, too, with the skill with which he can handle that thing. Now the boys are looking him over. Now there's the boss who's got the razor. He's the guy to whom all the others defer. How does he get that position, Dr. Brain? This is a process of natural relationships which go on in the gang. They test each other constantly. This kid is probably the brighter one of the bunch. He knows how to get around the cops. He also knows how to get the orange away from the others. Now here is the area in which they are going to carry on their initiation. They've decided that this kid is going to have to walk a 12-foot wall. He's going to have to walk down the full length of that wall without any controls. There's nothing on the other side. It's a bare wall. While he's up on the wall, they're going to pepper him with stones and rocks to see if he can keep his footing. If he can, uh, he can be a member of the gang. I suppose if he can't, uh, he'll be a wounded member of the gang. His first task is, of course, to get up on that wall, and then he's going to have to walk it. Now, this is the ritual of the gang. The gang has a ritual nature to it. It is involved with organization, control, and this is one of the ways in which they do organize the kids in the gang and control them. Once he goes through this initiation, he'll be a member of the gang, and he'll be able to participate in their activities. Of course, anyone that's belonged to a fraternal group or a little social club knows the sense in which this kind of initiation may take place, but only as one has lived in the backwash of the great cities of the land in communities such as this, can one see that the test and ordeal that's prescribed actually gives us a sign of a kind of adventurous, challenging, and even predatory behavior that becomes the content of experience of these youngsters? That, that's exactly correct. This is the stuff out of which comes gang behavior. This innocence and adventure. Out of this innocence and adventure comes the corruption, and it comes in the absence of recognizable adult supervision and leadership. These kids have their own means of identification, their own means of control. You remember the boy a little while ago talking about language as identification. This is the way they recognize each other. Now they're going through the second phase of the initiation. One might say this is also at this particular point, uh, how they're determining as to whether this lad is a square, as that other fellow said or not. That's right. Uh, we hope that he won't fall off and square his head here. Now they're going to participate in this rough house, test him out constantly. He'll not be a fully recognized member of the gang for some time, really. He's going to be a part of it, but not under complete control. This adventuring conduct here seems on the face of it to be almost innocent, as you pointed out, merely adventurous. Uh, how does it relate to delinquency? We'll see in just a minute, I think, how it relates to delinquency. The way in which these kids, in their interrelationships, in their interplay, begin to test their new strength as a unit. Now they'll, after they've tested just a little bit more, uh, they're starting to build up this exuberance. Uh, this horseplay is a measure of the power that they feel, the things that they want to do. They want to go out now and begin to really test this in the larger community. They want to show that they are, can act as a unit, can act aggressively as a unit towards others. Here they found something in one of the junkyards, which they have 
uh, complete access to and constant access to, this will be the key to their aggressive behavior. This is where they start. This is not going to be necessarily the act itself, but it'll show us, I think, how they can become uh, fermented. This is an older boy in the neighborhood, and they're a little bit afraid of him. He's a member of the bigger gang. He's graduated into the older boys' gang, and so they run from him because he know, they know that he has friends. But not everybody in the neighborhood has friends. Here's a boy that doesn't. Now, here they can show their aggressiveness. Here they can afford to be a little less fearful. This is the in-group, so to speak, against the outsider. Exactly, and here's the outsider. Here is the boy who is at, uh, at the mercy of the in-group. Here we see a young lady who is an actual addict, incidentally. Is she under the influence right there? We can assume that she is, yes. And this is a young friend of hers who is calling on her, who at this point is not addicted. He's rather fond of this young lady, and he's coming to visit her today. This looks like an ordinary little petting scene to me. Yes, it does, doesn't it? And yet, as we'll see as the uh, film develops, that it's somewhat more than that. She, at this point, is a marijuana user. He uses nothing, and as we've just seen, wishes to use nothing. However, his attraction for her is unfortunately so great that he will very shortly begin to use the marijuana, as we'll see. Well, is uh, the smoking of marijuana habit-forming? It is habit-forming, yes. It is not addicting, uh, using the terms that you developed a little earlier on this program. Now this, as we see, is a rather typical pattern with young drug addicts. Association with an individual or with a group becomes so important to the non-using individual that they will begin to use, merely so that they can maintain their association, their affiliation with the group, even knowing uh, what the drug will do. In other words, you can't be a square and belong, and that applies to this as surely as it does, let us say, to a party or some other social event. There's no question about it. Now here we see the young lady has almost finished the entire cigarette and yet wants to get every bit out of it that she can. These cigarettes retail, incidentally, for somewhere between 25 cents and a dollar, depending on the locality. Is it hard for a young person like this to find a supply? Unfortunately, it's not hard. It's, it's extraordinarily easy. Now we see the time is 7.45. And 15 minutes later, the boy has been using the marijuana and they are both high, or as the addict says, they've both taken off. And they have the feeling of relaxation, of lassitude, of general ease. Is this on the nod? This is in a very real sense on the nod, and you can see why they use the term. Now, some months later, the boy himself has begun to use uh, what the addicts call heavy stuff. In all probability, this is heroin, which is an addicting drug <clears throat> and the most commonly used of the addicting drugs. At this point, he's experiencing withdrawal, a very agonizing, horrifying experience. There you can see the track, the little mark over the blood vessel, the scar tissue that is formed by prolonged use of drugs which are injected uh, into a major blood vessel. Now, in the withdrawal, he's now experiencing cramps. They perspire very, very heavily. There's nausea, vomiting, insomnia, aching joints, and all of these things that I've mentioned in accentuated degree. Well, I take it anticipating that agony is one of the things that controls a person and keeps him on the habit, that is, keeps him looking for the drug to avoid those symptoms. Is that right? Very much so. Very much so. And as we saw in the, or heard in the case interview a little earlier, even though they no longer get a high when they're heavily addicted, they must continue to use the drugs to avoid getting sick, to avoid withdrawal. Now, what do we have here? This is one way that an addict prepares a fix for himself, prepares his shot. This addict is emptying the capsules of heroin into a bent teaspoon. 
Now after emptying the capsules of heroin into the teaspoon, he will add some water to dissolve it, and heroin incidentally is very highly soluble in water. The solution, cooks, will then, that that's it? right, the solution will be heated, the attic calls is cooking it. After cooking it, he'll draw it up into the needle, into the eyedropper, and incidentally, this is another common uh, misapprehension that people have. Uh, the addicts don't use needles and syringes, they use an eyedropper with a small gauge needle attached to the end of it. It's very easy to conceal, they're very easy to purchase, they're not at all hard to come by. In other words, we won't control the traffic by controlling the sale of hypodermic syringes. I wish it were that simple. Uh, there have been proposals of that kind which shows how unrelated to the facts some proposals for law and control are. Now we see he's finished cooking it and he's drawing it up into the eyedropper and he'll very shortly inject it. The use of this teaspoon, incidentally, is one of the uh, niceties that most addicts don't use. Most of them will use a bottle cap or any other small vessel available to them at the moment. And likewise, uh, using water, although it's most common, addicts have been known to use other fluids. They use body fluids of any kind in order to cook their fix. Now here we see the addict in beginning to inject the heroin into a blood vessel, and you can see the tracks once again. This is obviously a man who's been using drugs for a relatively long period of time now. Now this man will build up this habit, so he has to take ever larger and larger uh, shots, will he not? Oh yes, this is uh, as sure as night follows day. And is this what is meant by tolerance? Yes, this is one of the things that we mean by tolerance. The body builds up a tolerance level for... Even such a beginning as this one, where one day he and some friends are merely playing hooky, truant from school, and here someone reports him. The juvenile officer appears, takes him out of the movie, back to his school or his home. And what seemed to have been an innocent prank has now begun to give him a character, a meaning, his experience, which never existed for him, but which now exists because society has taken a view of his act. And here his father enters into the picture and takes him to the school. And the father chastises him and argues with him and says that he has given the family a bad name. And this has dramatized his evil. And he is now at odds with his father. He is at odds with the school. And as a consequence, he seeks the company of those with whom he will not be at odds. And here he finds persons like himself having unfortunate experiences, but who prize these experiences. And as a result of it, take comfort in exchanging little waywardnesses, such as, for example, he learns in this company of another who can steal a car. And so he gets involved in more serious activities, still not far removed from pranks, because this kind of theft is merely for fun, for joyriding, and not necessarily to sell the product that he has stolen. But here again, as he carries on his theft in the company of others who, like himself, have been somewhat estranged, put apart from the conventional community, he is caught by the law. And the law in all its majesty and discipline and sternness takes him into the courts, takes him before a special officer, proceeds to make of him a record, a statistic in a world of which he is a singular part and which most others never experience and in which they never find their names. He is getting a view of himself subtly and without even realizing it, which is created for him by the community around him in the attitude that that community has taken toward him. For example, here he will appear in terms of a juvenile record as one who can be referred to on a subsequent occasion as one who has already erred, as one who would later appear as a two-time loser or a three-time loser. This is something which no other person but one subjected to these experience can't internalize, can take to himself. Here is the court, and he comes before it, and there, sternly and with probity, is a judge. And he admonishes him. And he, in the presence of others, represents society in looking 
down upon him and asks him why he did what he did. Everywhere he's called upon to explain as if there is some very special explanation. And in this special explanation is the ready acceptance of the notion, perhaps I am different. Perhaps these things come naturally to me. Perhaps I have found a way which distinguishes me and I am ready to accept it and live with it and abide by it. They don't understand me. They don't deal with the real problems that urge and move me. They simply tell me I am this and they must be right. All this elaborate apparatus alienates, estranges, takes out of the common life of society an individual. And finally, day after day, experience after experience, proceeds to systematically sophisticate this individual and make of him an accomplished offender who seeks out the finer arts, the higher arts of crime. One who would like to think of himself in better terms. But what are the better terms for such an individual? The better terms of crime, the better terms of delinquency. And so a, a record, a long record begins to get elaborated. And he starts out with relatively simple acts and finally is one day on a wanted list. One day he is a two-time, a three-time, a four-time loser. One day he has only been in a juvenile home, but then he has been in a reformatory and in a county jail and again in a penitentiary. And finally, his education is complete when he enters home, for he must have a group life. And as a rejected person, simply in that very obvious and direct sense, he may be driven to delinquent. And here we see a world of different nationalities, cultures, if you please, at variance with the American standard and scene. The youngsters caught between the values of their elders and the values of the school and the wider community. And the wider community may indeed regard these as less favored, less acceptable groups and members, religiously, in national terms. And this is a kind of group rejection that complicates our life. Here at church, in a community of Chicago, where there have been as many as seven different nationalities living over a period of 40 years, moving each after the other, creating a differing experience for the youngsters of that community, presenting indeed a tradition of conflict with the broader standards of the community and as a result making a chronic problem of adjustment on the part of young people. Here the background of that institution, the slum if you please, congestion of population, tenement houses, the dirt and filth of the surrounding community, the habitat of the gang, youngsters without play space, youngsters in a world apart under elevated structures to themselves and beyond the guidance and direction of the adult community. And here adjacent as well, another type of human material which influences the behavior of youngsters. The so-called flop house area or skid row, the street of homeless men, transients moving in and moving out, many of them disorganized, many of them given to liquor, frequent, immediate, apparent in the community to the young people there, their stuff of life. And correspondingly, these things adjust to them and they to them. And it is reflected in such patterns as rolling drunks, 